Marvin, the idea of brains, human brains, has fascinated me my whole life as the, as the microcosm for how we understand existence. It's really a, a probe of what reality is about. And trained as a neuroscientist, the people I've talked to are generally neuroscientists, neuroanatomists, physiologists, talking about brains. You come at it from a radically different perspective. And I really need to understand your concept of a society of minds in understanding the brain. Well, the brain is an amazing object. And uh, it sort of started maybe 400 million years ago, just shortly after the first plants and animals appeared. And uh, the plants just stayed where they are. And the animals were cells that uh, could move around a bit. But uh, as evolution proceeded, they found more ways to move using the same motor organs. And so there had to be some kind of switching. If you have a, uh, a lot of little muscles, you need something to tell them what to do. And at first, it was just clumps of neurons. Neurons evolved very early in the history of animals. And they're almost the same today. That is, the basic chemistry and the way nerves conduct and uh, most of the ways that synapses work have not changed much for 400 million years. Because uh, one problem with evolution is that if you evolve something and other activities depend on it, then any change is liable to be fatal. So you could only make little changes in how the neurons are organized and how many there are and where they're placed. But you couldn't make, or it couldn't make any serious changes in, in how they uh, act. Well, what happened is that as animals develop better locomotion, they needed uh, better ways to control them, their motion. And this little clump of cells that was the first brain, nobody knows what it was like, <coughs> Uh, got duplicated and duplicated until it became a line of almost the same thing. So if you look inside a centipede, you see about a hundred little brains, each sending signals to the next and receiving signals from its neighbors, and interesting waves propagate, and this animal moves along. But the important thing from the human point of view is that at some point, the little brains in front became more and more concerned with perception and uh, things like rudimentary eyes and noses and ears evolved. And we are descended from a strain of animals that had 12 little brains in the front and a couple of hundred uh, trailing down. So a typical fish has, or, or a snake, has a, a little neural segment for each muscle and maybe 300 in a long snake. But the vertebrates, which uh, evolved about uh, 300 million years ago, uh, got these 12 big segments in front. And those eventually fused to be the brain. And so the 300 million years, or 400 million years ago, we were fish. And 300 million years ago, we were amphibians. Uh, on the coast, and then 200 million years reptiles, and mammals are about 100 million years old. And they developed and developed. And about 5 million years ago, uh, the smartest animals were the dolphins and the chimpanzees in two different worlds. And no one knows just what happened in the 5 million years since we split from the orangutans and baboons and chimpanzees and gorillas. Those are the four main, uh, uh, what do you call Primate. them, primates. And uh, we're the ones where the brain started to develop more and more. And the first few segments took over new functions. And while most neuroscientists are interested in how the brain cells work, to me, that's pretty much like trying to understand a computer from how the transistors work. It's many, many levels of organization below uh, the important things that distinguish a, a human from a crayfish or a, uh, a snake or whatever. And I'm interested in the question of how the 
this piece of machinery, the brain, can do things like remember what it's been doing in the past and can decide that what it's doing didn't work. How does it develop new goals? How does it develop new methods for achieving goals? And most important, how does it make a model of itself as a being in a world mm -hmm. and think about its own future and its past and its relatives and this very high level stuff? And those are questions that neuroscientists don't like to talk about very much because they see that as too futuristic, too vague, too, too high level. They still want to explain how people work in terms of how the neurons uh, transmit sodium and potassium <laughs> through their membranes and how each cell excites the next. And I in order to really understand the functioning, you really have to understand these, these concepts of mind. You, you talk about, in general terms, an A brain and a B brain, an A brain that, that, that maybe has a, a receptor that, that gets information from the outside world, and a B brain that does deliberative or reflective or internal uh, things. And th th that's a conceptual way to begin to understand how a brain works. Yes. The <coughs> Most of psychology for the last hundred years has been concerned with explaining how an animal reacts to a particular situation or condition. And the simplest way of explaining that, <coughs> excuse me, simplest way of explaining that sort of thing started around 1900 with uh, scientists like Pavlov and, uh, and others who developed the idea of condi conditioned reflexes. The idea that maybe the brain is like a big table of instructions which say, if this happens, do that, if this, and if this happens, do that. Then the interesting question is, uh, an animal is born with a bunch of those, but how does it learn new ones, and uh, what kind of experiences will cause it to behave in certain ways? At the same time as the behavior is started, around the late 1800s, there were three or four scientists who thought about the higher levels of thinking, like uh, what is involved in when a person uh, remembers what they've been doing, and uh, how does a person imagine things that aren't real, and how do you react to an imaginary scene? If I say, uh, what would happen if my hand had six fingers? And now I'm visualizing it, and I'm having a strange superposition of where's the, where's the extra finger. Yeah. If I ask, what if I had three hands, where would I put the third one? Yeah. <laughs> we can do things in our head that have very little connection with the real world, and yet for some people those images are as striking and impressive mm -hmm. as, uh, as really seeing things. For some other people don't visualize things very much, but they can feel what it would be like yeah. and, and so forth. So I'm interested in that level. And as I was saying, in the late 1800s, there were a handful of people, uh, William James in the US, Francis Galton in England, uh, Wundt, uh, and Freud. Uh, Freud made complicated theories of how people uh, have various kinds of goals and how goals maybe your very simple goals of acquisition and survival conflict with mm -hmm. your uh, social goals of pleasing people and getting along and uh, acquiring status. And for Freud, the mind is a battleground between instinctive goals and high-level goals. Now, a lot of current neuroscientists would say a lot of that stuff is really not terribly relevant. That was done in an age when we didn't understand the brain, and really that can't help us very much in understanding what the brain really is, because the brain really is what's under our electrodes and, and chemical probes and anatomical traces and all of that. And you've proposed this society of mind in terms of the modules of the mind as really a, not just a metaphor for understanding, but, but, but in a sense the real software of the brain. Yes, well, if we now know and <clears throat> this was pretty well understood around 1900, that the brain has many different parts. And uh, if you look in the appendix to, in the index of a neuroscience book, I'm thinking of Candle and Schwartz, mm -hmm. which is yeah. this big, and in the index you'll find a listing which includes several hundred different brain centers. And you know that this one mm 
appears to do such and such, and this appears to do such and such. And uh, you might think, the way I think of it is uh, to say, well, it's like a great network of computers, each of which is specialized. It's not that it's a society of little people, <laughs> but here's a, here's a machine somewhere here for imagining a physical structure. And here's a little higher level one that says, uh, what would that hand look like with an extra finger? Or uh, what if it were a, uh, a hoof or, or something like that? And the question is, if you have 400 different computers, it's like saying here's a Macintosh and here's a Sun and here's a... Uh, so you can't understand a computer even if you know everything about its circuits, about how its transistors work. You really need to know what the procedures are and the programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, uh, in most computers, most of the programming is done in a higher level language, and the expressions of that language describe hundreds or thousands of little operations on the next level down. And if you extend this thinking, you realize that the neurons and synapses are maybe six levels below the thoughts that you're actually aware about, aware of. And those thoughts are real things. They're not things that are abstractions that don't help us understand the brain. They're really necessary to understand to understand human consciousness. That's right. If you try to understand how some big word processor works, you'd have to understand the language in which the word processor, word processes are written. Uh, for example, when you say, let's justify that line so that the right margin is straight then there's a very complicated process which is adding up the size of the spaces mm -hmm. and uh, dividing that mm -hmm. by the number of spaces in a line. And uh, if any of the spaces get too big when it spreads them mm -hmm. out, then it says, oh, well, I'll move another word over and maybe I'll even hyphenate it if it's a desperate mm -hmm. situation. You can't understand those processes by looking at the transistors or yes. the neurons <laughs> in the programmer's mind you have to look at these very high-level descriptions. And in my book, The Emotion Machine, I argue that there are at least six big levels of analysis, and each of them has to be understood by itself. Any particular thing that happens in level five can be understood as a combination of maybe 20 or 50 things that happen in level four, and so forth. But you can understand level five, even if you know everything about how neurons and synapses work. Mm. One reason for this is that most of the cortex, the, what's the difference between a human and a crayfish or a, or a worm? A human has these multiple levels of brain that, that the uh, earlier animals didn't have. And uh, most of the cortex is made up of what are called micro columns, each of which may have five or 600 or between 100 and 1,000 cells. And what are the, what's the significance of the fact that the brain, the higher part of the brain, is made of these columns. I claim that these are to insulate the high-level processes from the properties of the synapses. Oh. So a lot of neuroscientists say, if we understood just how a synapse changes, a synapse is the connection between two neurons. Sure. And the standard theory of learning in crayfish or worms is that uh, certain connections between neurons get thicker or stronger a little protein yeah, develops yeah. here, and the nerve impulse uh, propagates through that. So that's called uh, long-term potentiation or something. And then there's some short-term changes. Well, I don't think those properties are r even indirectly related, very indirectly related, I should say, to how you remember uh, what Robert Kuhn said a minute ago, that I can store that. I think that's remembered by the major states of maybe uh, two or 3,000 of these cortical columns. Mm -hmm. And the columns are designed so that they can store something yes or no definitely for mm -hmm. a certain period without any changes in probability or mm -hmm. conductions. And these go away in 10 minutes and you do something else. So uh, one thing I would like to communicate to neuroscientists is that they have to be more serious about looking at the insulation theory. There's, there's a variety of uh, theorists called connectionists. And they say the important thing about the brain is how things are connected to each other. Well, you could also argue that it's even more important to know how things 
why you don't get a big traffic jam because there's too many connections. And I believe that the cortical columns, which are sort of intermediate in complexity, are clever devices which act more like flip-flops and more like mm -hmm. uh, little templates and forms mm -hmm. to fill out mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> than they act like synapses. And we evolved these so that we could have reliable short-term memories and, and uh, structures like that and represent knowledge in many different ways instead of just as the probability that one cell is connected to another.